Um, so I'm going to give a paper about desire which, uh, in which I criticise lots of people for not really thinking about history, but ironically I've written a wildly eclectic, unsystematic and actually completely decontextualising paper. I just realised the irony of this, maybe there's a Freudian explanation. Um, yeah, so I'm aware that, um, and I'm kind of reading things quite willfully, naively, and, and I'm trying to kind of reconstruct my own sort of uh, thought process was, while I was trying to find my way through certain um, concepts. Um, I have an epigraph. Desire has no history. Susan Sontag. Uh, why? Because its history hasn't been written, because its history can't be written, because the history of sexuality has nothing to do with the history of desire, because historically specific discourses about desire float above desire itself, because desire is timeless, eternal, its supposed unruliness and dynamism strangely static, because even if individuals' desires change constantly, desire somehow doesn't, because desire can't be changed, was never different, because desire evades all attempts to describe it, because desire just is, because it's underneath history buried somewhere, because it has nothing to do with the world or experiences in it, because it precedes history, because it transcends it. For a while I was trying to write something about desire, trying to articulate a Marxist conception of desire or at least trace histories of the concept of desire on the left. And in so doing, I was struck again and again how often the assumption that desire has no history seemed to be taken for granted rarely explicitly stated, but nonetheless lurking in the background of texts, even those by people who seemed keen on historicizing almost everything else. Think, for example, of Marcuse's insistence in One Dimensional Man that fucking in a car is much worse than fucking in a field, which not only seems to assume that technology is inimicable to the satisfaction of desire, or indeed that fields are somehow more natural than cars or external to capitalist modernity, but it assumes that desire is constrained rather than shaped by the contemporary world. His concept of non-repressive sublimation seems to assume that desire is socially smothered, but can be set free. But of course I would have this dictum of, you know, Jameson's always historicized rattling around in my head. Here's another example from something I read recently, the title of which excited me, but the conclusions of which seem to crash into familiar problems. This is uh, Mario Miele's Towards a Gay Communism, which was first published in Italian in 1977 as elements of a homosexual critique, recently reissued in a full translation in English. Um, Miele engages with and repurposes psychoanalytic ideas. Against the psychoanalytic establishment, he insists on the radical implications of particular Freudian concepts like polymorphous perversity and elaborates on Freud's claim that homosexual desire is a universal phenomenon, that in the beginning everyone is bisexual. Rereading Freud's three essays on sexuality, Miele discusses Freud's proposition that in early infancy, perversion, the potential erotic attraction of everything and every, um, to everything and everyone, is the norm. He says, everyone is born endowed with a wide range of erotic propensity, directed first of all toward the self and the mother, then gradually turning outward to everyone else, irrespective of their sex, and in fact, toward the entire world. Miele departs from Freud in seeing the imposition of heterosexuality as a form of erotic mutilation imposed by an oppressive society, a damaging deviation from nature. The norm, he says, is based on the mutilation of eros. According to Miele, the implication of Freud's insights are that homosexual desire exists as a residue latently present in everyone, all are latent queens. Miele uses the term transsexuality to refer to the seething plural desires buried in all people but repressed by social norms. But fluidity and plurality is weirdly ahistorical here. For Miele, it's not that homosexuality is a pathology as mainstream psychiatrists and psychoanalysts claimed, but that society produces pathological symptoms by forcing people to suppress their underlying desires. And because bisexuality is universal, this impacts everyone, producing a general neurosis. It's straight people adjusted to the mutilating norms of capitalist society who are truly sick. <coughs> he says, we consider heterosexuality to be a pathological, biological, psychosexual adaptation resulting from pervasive fears surrounding the expression of homosexual impulses. <laughs> 
So sexual behavior and discourse is social and historical, and social experiences might make, make, might make people think their desires conform with social norms. But desire itself is originally, at least, something else, and this original desire would ideally be recaptured. He argues that labeling homosexuality a deviance or neurosis to be cured overlooks vital passion and human desire. While there's much about this argument to embrace politically, I couldn't help but feel disappointed that a communist theory of desire still affirms nature, understood as some pure or purely perverse origin point against history. This natural origin point is obviously ontogenetic here, so he's affirming the kind of radical pervert baby, uh, but it's also implicitly phylogenetic or social. But does a sexually liberated communist future really need to be reached by appealing to an imagined natural past? The first thing I came across that articulated my nebulous frustrations with sort of very different theories from different traditions was Rosemary Hennessy's critique of Deleuze and Guattari. Writing in the early 70s in the aftermath of May 68 and on the cusp of a new crisis of capitalism, Anti-Oedipus rejected not only the traditional psych psychoanalytic Oedipal triad, mummy, daddy, me, but also pushed against orthodox Marxism. Desire is central to their analysis, which understands people as desiring machines, interconnected, porous, and entangled machinic organisms, not one id, but many. Society and the desiring machines inhabiting and constituting it are animated by flows of libidinal desire. Deleuze and Guattari castigate the Oedipal triangle of traditional psychoanalysis for being too reductive, for repressing the wild pluralities of desire, which can be understood as sexual only insofar as sexuality is everywhere. You know, the way a bureaucrat fondles his records, or whatever they say. Um, in Profit and Pleasure, Sexual Identities in Late Capitalism, Hennessy criticizes the way anti-Oedipus was lauded by many queer theorists as a monumental explanation of the materiality of desire under capitalism. The appeal of this work for theorists of sexuality, she claims, lays in its proposition that desire is disruptive and untethered from prescriptive, i.e. heteronormative or cisnormative, relations between sexual subjects and sexual objects. But according to Hennessy, what such analyses miss is that desire for Deleuze and Guattari is a kind of trans-historical substance. Desire, she says, is historically invariant matter. So desire may not be buried or mutilated by capitalism in this account. It's already everywhere. But it's this kind of trans-historicism that she identifies that I was interested in. Deleuze and Guattari may dispense with the Oedipus complex, but they maintain that human existence has a primal substrate. Hennessy argues that this approach glorifies desire and obscures the extent to which the desiring subject is formed by history, specifically by different phases of capitalist development. But here, I guess, you maybe run into the opposite problem, which is, like, are people just identical to the world in which they live? Anyway, so she says, Deleuze and Guattari acknowledges that acknowledge that capitalism liberates the flow of desire from the clutches of an Oedipalizing culture, as they see it, desire is revolutionary and capable of demolishing social form. But unfortunately and predictably, the alternative it aims for is not social justice, but the body without organs, the undifferentiated subject of self-enjoyment. Desire has a privileged status in their account, and the desiring subject takes the place of the proletariat as the primary agent of historical change. But the historical constitution of desire itself is strangely external to these processes. Although they constantly invoke capitalism, Hennessy argues that their account detaches desire from historical and material production. The structures of exploitation on which capitalist production depends have completely disappeared. For Hennessy, the challenge is to recognize that desire does not precede the social or economic and thus cannot be disentangled or considered in isolation from its historical articulation. Indeed, dehistoricizing desire can participate in naturalizing existing social relations, even as Deleuze and Guattari want to claim the opposite. That desire cannot be separated from capitalism and class relations does not, however, lead Hennessy to dismiss desire and pleasure as bourgeois inventions irrelevant to material analysis. Instead, analyzing the historical specificity of desire and its constitutive relation to capitalism might form part of a historical struggle to transform the oppressive world in which we live. So while I was trying to think about these questions last year, is desire historical or historicizable? If so, can it be reshaped, etc.? cetera? Um, two essays were published which also circled around similar issues. Um, 
Andrea Long Chu's On Liking Women, which was published in N Plus One, and Armia Srinivasan's Does Anyone Have the Right to Sex, which was published in the LRB. Um, so Long Chu declares in On Liking Women, nothing good comes of forcing desire to conform to political principle. And she's making this comment in a discussion of the limits and ultimate failures of political lesbianism as a project. For Chu, even if you can decide who to fuck or who not to fuck for political reasons, you can't always decide who you desire. Desire, she says, is much more unruly than that. Desire is inconvenient, wayward. Desire can have terrible reactionary taste in spite of the desiring subject's impeccable politics. My mind is telling me no, but my body is telling me yeah. The political lesbian is stuck between the rock of politics and desire's hard place, Chu claims. The political lesbian is threatened by desire's ungovernability. The image of desire as a hard place on the one hand, and descriptions of it as dynamic and flowy on the other, captures something about the contradiction I've been trying to articulate. Political lesbianism, along with other sexual liberation era movements, not only sought to reorganize social and sexual relationships, but sought to reorganize the psyche, purging it of all remnants of patriarchy. Political lesbianism is founded on the belief that even desire becomes pliable at high enough temperatures, says Chu. And for the political lesbians that she's discussing, lesbianism was not an innate identity, she says, but an act of political will. She presents these ideas as, as slightly absurd, or at least naive, prone to moralism, prescription, and censoriousness. People desire bad things all the time. The desire to, des the desire, to desire differently, to desire in a good, non-oppressive way, turns out to be oppressive in its own way. But does desire precede or exceed the desiring subject? Is desire, if desire can't or shouldn't be reshaped, then what is it or what should happen? Can a critique of voluntarism, or like the, a critique of the kind of capacity to kind of consciously uh, redirect desire, be distinguished from an argument for the historicization of desire? Chu presents gender transition um, also as a question of the force of a desire, which she counterposes to the truth of an identity, which makes a lot of sense, yet something in her characterization of desire suggests there's less separating desire from identity, wanting from being, than she implies, because in her account, desire just is. It, does, it seems like some kind of eternal metaphysical substance waiting in the basement of the subject. There's a de temporal dim dimension missing here, which I think a kind of, if I'd have talked more about psychoanalysis properly, I think it would be capable of um, addressing, um, which is the problem of kind of living as if society's already changed, as if our psyches weren't already shaped by the society in which we've already lived. Um, and I think Juliet Mitchell's work on feminism and psychoanalysis is still really good on this question. Um, so uh, Armia Srinivasan's Does Anyone Have the Right to Sex, which was published in the LRB last year, engages directly with Chu's essay. Um, her starting point, though, is not the desires of political lesbians, but the desires of incels. She glosses feminist debates about sex and desire very roughly Sex is bad because patriarchy, Catherine McKinnon, uh, versus sex is good because women can experience pleasure, which she kind of associates with Ellen Willis and sex positive feminism. She writes, uh, the case made by Willis in Lust Horizons has so far proved the enduring one. Since the 1980s, the wind has been behind a feminism which takes desire for the most part as a given. Your desire takes the shape that it takes and which insists that acting on that desire is morally constrained only by the boundaries of consent. Sex is no longer morally problematic or unproblematic. It is instead merely wanted or unwanted. But she continues, uh, echoing Hennessy's arguments, it would be disingenuous to make nothing of the convergence, however unintentional, between sex positivity and liberalism in their shared reluctance to interrogate the formation of our desires. When we see consent as the sole constraint on OK sex, we are pushed towards a naturalization of sexual preference in which the rape fantasy becomes a primordial rather than a political fact. She points to all the sexual preferences and no-goes regularly included in people's dating app profiles, stating racial preferences and gender, physical fitness, height, weight, age, etc., asking whether we should really accept as a given 
as something entirely outside of the social, all these forms of prescription. So, you know, these decisions, she says, are never just personal. Though she's sympathetic to choose arguments, she still pushes against her claims about desire by stating that a feminism that totally abjures the political critique of desire is a feminism with little to say about the injustices of exclusion and misrecognition suffered by the women who arguably need feminism the most. She concludes that the very idea of fixed sexual preference is political, not metaphysical, but she remains unsure about the possibility of consciously redirecting desires. Does society have to change first? And if so, how does the desire for social transformation itself then emerge? So after crashing into these kinds of impasses in all these very different uh, contexts, um, I actually found myself reading I was thinking, where can I read about desire and Marxism? So I just weirdly opened Capital Volume 1. Um, there's a great essay that I, wrote, I read recently, which was a paper given at HM by the theorist Chris Chitty. And he, he kind of castigates Foucault for reading Capital Volume 1 too carefully when he was uh, writing the history of sexuality. But I haven't, and I think where, where Foucault's really reading the kind of, I guess, the chapters on things like the working day, so further into capital. I'm, I'm really starting at the beginning. Um, yeah, and I didn't have time to kind of integrate Titi's observations here. So, on the opening page of the first section and chapter of capital, Marx writes, a commodity is, in the first place, an object outside us, a thing that by its properties satisfies human wants of some sort or another. The nature of such wants whether, for instance, they spring for the stomach or from fancy makes no difference. Neither are we here concerned to know about how the object satisfies these wants, whether directly as means of subsistence or indirectly as means of production. The statement is accompanied by a footnote citing the economist Nicola Barbon, proclaiming that desire implies want, it is the appetite of the mind and as natural as hunger to the body. Marx may not have held that desire is natural or ahistorical, as Barbon implies, but in Capital, the content and specificity of human desire is not his concern. It makes no difference. So what would it take to include desire in the analysis? Uh, David Harvey repeatedly uses a trio of words, wants, needs, or desires, to capture what use values satisfy in humans. And it's, but it's less easy to draw the neat, neat distinctions between these three words than it might first seem, especially in the context of Marx's arguments, which are so keen to push the complicated and complicating question of human motivations and passions aside. Marx perceives that even seemingly natural wants, such as food, clothing, fuel, and housing, change not only according to climate or geographical location, but also according to social contexts. The number and, and extent of his so-called necessary wants, as also the modes of satisfying them, are themselves the product of historical development. So there's a sort of hint here that there is a kind of uh, historical account of desire somewhere, but it's sort of also absent. Um, as Agnes Heller puts it in The Theory of Need in Marx, although satisfaction of a need is the sine qua non of any commodity, and Marx uses the concept of need in order to make definitions, he never actually defines the concept of need itself. And the same goes with desire. So, hmm. I don't need to go into all of this. So Marx sometimes implies that the qualitative difference between use values he discusses are self-evident, or in here in the things themselves. But ultimately, use value is determined by the relation of people to things. People may want, need, or desire use values due to their qualitative properties, but that there are any number of reasons for wanting, needing, or desiring something. Marx gives the example of a weaver who chooses to exchange their linen for a Bible for purposes of edification. But this is specific example of a use for the Bible could be substituted for another. It makes no difference what the weaver wants, needs, or desires the Bible for to make the Bible a use value. Um, he claims that there's nothing mysterious about a commodity solely, uh, considered solely in relation to its use. It's value that's weird and ethereal, whereas use value is, is coarse and material. But he, he demonst uh, while he demonstrates that value lies hidden behind exchange value, human wants, needs, and desires also lie hidden behind use value. 
Use values take various forms, which are dissolved in exchange value, but the forms of want, need, and desire that dictate whether they will be exchanged for other use values are even more varied. So, yeah, I was kind of interested in how he's actually extinguishing the qualitative differences between wants, needs, and desires here, um, ex effectively excluding them as factors in his analysis of capitalist accumulation, whilst at certain moments acknowledging that they are kind of historically formed and dif differentiated or whatever. So, yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to think whether... I kind of then moved through thinking about um, this kind of specific question in relation to use values and then thinking about a kind of uh, th different theories of like how desire was specifically cultivated at a particular moment in relation to kind of making commodities seem particularly uh, desirable. So in Capital, Marx basically talks about, when he talks about the desire of individuals, he's usually talking about the bourgeoisie and he talks about, you know, the cupidity of mill owners and such like. And it's apparently, I think, only really in Grundrisse where he starts talking about consumerism in relation to um, the proletariat and the kind of the need to sort of um, create desires. Um, but I just wanted to finish, and so I'm kind of like abbreviating here my, my own sort of journey through all of this different material. Um, by, and so I'm sort of going to cut to a, a, fi a final kind of discussion about different treatments of the figure of, of sex work and the figure of the sex worker um, in terms of thinking about the relationship between um, desire and capitalism. Yeah, so that's going to be my final section. Um, Walter Benjamin's discussions of the gendering and sexualization of commodities in the arcades project is bound up with his obsession with the figure of the pr Parisian prostitute. According to Esther Leslie, this figure for Benjamin is not an exceptional figure, but an exemplary one, the analysis of whom sheds light on capitalist social relations generally, and specifically on the entanglement of capitalism and desire. Leslie writes, as dialectical image, the prostitute synthesizes the exploitative labor of sales and marketing and the commodity as exchange value. Leslie is keen to defend Benjamin against liberal feminists who have read his discussions of the twinkling arcades as celebrations of consumerism and his discussions of sex workers as denigrations of women. His analysis, she stresses, is intended as an indictment of the commodity form and of the exploitative economic system under which the Parisian sex worker and everyone else lives. Often, however, Benjamin's discussions of the sex worker slip into metaphor, which Leslie doesn't really want to admit, as when he cites Baudelaire's consideration of the prostitution of the commodity's soul. Indeed, Benjamin explicitly states that the prostitute does not sell her labor power. He seems to view her less as an archetypal worker than as a literal embodiment of Marx's personified mystical commodity. According to Benjamin, love for the prostitute is the apotheosis of empathy with the commodity. The intoxicating lure of the commodity is replicated in the sex worker who is similarly conceptualized by him as a thing with a soul. But the sex worker is a worker. Benjamin suggests that, the work, that workers, in the contradictory position of passing time until a revolutionary opportunity arises, find charm even in damaged and decaying goods, which reflect the decaying qualities of bourgeois capitalist society. He cites a Baudelaire poem about a courtesan whose heart is described as being bruised like a peach. Here the proletariat is put in the position of the client, John, and the sex worker in the position of the commodity, but this sets up a false distinction between these two subjects whose bruised hearts both beat in the wallet of the person to whom their labor power is sold, to steal a metaphor from Marx. Maya and Andrea Gonzalez and Cassandra Troyen more recently reflect on a contemporary iteration of sex work in their analysis of the girlfriend experience, which involves rich, often, unmarried, often married men seeking a ready-made companion in exchange for gifts and money. Unlike Benjamin, who treats the Parisian sex worker as a commodity rather than a worker, they position the sugar baby as a worker who offers a standpoint and the contemporary predicament of abject subjects. <laughs> 
In the girlfriend experience, the services being sold are intimacy or authenticity in addition to sex, a counterfeit version of a genuine romance. The imperative to enjoy authentic sexual enjoyment is to desire authenticity more than sex itself. They emphasize that the disavowal of the relationship's basis in exchange is key to the encounter, which must convincingly simulate an authentic bond between sugar daddy and sugar baby. The sugar baby only succeeds in her role through the creation of a fantasy of reciprocity in which her wage status goes unacknowledged. Commodifying experience requires an imaginary reenactment of mutual freedom at the site of asymmetrical power and drudgery, they say. Gonzalez and Troyen argue that the fact the relationship is premised on exchange is a source of shame, or at least an impediment to pleasure for the client. Whereas for Benjamin, through the logic of abstraction, money functions to distance the customer from the guilt he says they attach to their pleasure, to the purchase. In his rather lurid metaphor, the shame-reddened wound on the body of society secretes money and closes up. It forms a metallic scab. Gonzalez and Troyen's analysis goes further by suggesting that under existing social conditions, a metallic scab might be preferable to a bloody one, that the heart of the waged girlfriend might be more impervious to bruising or more capable of inflicting bruises on the body of society than that of the unwaged one, Rather than a metaphor for the commodity's soul, the sugar baby comes to occupy the same space for passing time as the workers described by Benjamin. Drawing on ethnographic fieldwork conducted uh, in the Bay Area in the late 1990s, Elizabeth Bernstein found that for many sexual clients, the market is experienced as, an en as enhancing and facilitating desired forms of non-domestic sexual activity. Bernstein lords the role of sex workers in, in disembedding the male individual from the sex romance nexus of the privatized nuclear family. She's dismissive of the platitudinous view that sexuality has become commodified and by implication diminished like everything else in late capitalism. Her criticism seems to imply that those who protest to the commodity form would therefore validate a return to some supposedly more natural or genuine form of romantic encounter and hence uphold normative value family values and sexual mores, or that they would refuse to acknowledge the possibility of experiencing any form of pleasure under capitalism. The counterfeit auth authenticity and feigned intimacy demanded by the particular form of waged work, Gonzalez and Troyan analyze, does not stand in contrast to some pure, unmediated, or genuine form of human interaction outside it, however. Similarly, for Leslie, the revolutionary dimension of Benjamin's discussions of women in crisis in the arcades is that they expose the artificiality of hegemonic gender relations, including the notions that sex should be reproductive, families should be nuclear, and women should be confined to the private sphere. She writes, in detailing modern women's affinity for the a-natural and the commodified, Benjamin is not caught up in a romantic nostalgia for a lost naturalness. His aim is to validate out of the wreckage the explicit shift of women into the realm of history and culture, recognizing the enormity of its social and political implications. It is the revolutionary chance for salvation. He's not a moralist providing positive images, but a purveyor of negativity with an explosive charge. Desire, similarly, is not natural or eternal, and social changes that have occurred under capitalism should not simply be understood as mutilations of an ideal nature. Artificial, historically produced, but thus transformable, desire is not something to be recovered, but something to be transformed. And that, perhaps, can only be approached negatively. <laughs> <laughs>